Most of the countries in the Caribbean have done a great job of containing the COVID-19 pandemic, with a few notable exceptions, namely Haiti and the Dominican Republic. A University of Oxford study highlighted Trinidad and Tobago as being among the most successful. However, management of wildlife and illegal hunting in that country remains ineffective. The International Union for Conservation of Nature lists 66 endangered or vulnerable species in Trinidad and Tobago, including fish and amphibians. A few, like the piping guan, a bird, are listed as critically endangered because of being avidly hunted. Could the scourge of illegal hunting in Trinidad and Tobago lead to an outbreak of another zoonotic disease? I am IPS Caribbean correspondent Jewel Fraser, and in this Voices from the Global South podcast, I talk with the University of the West Indies virologist, a wildlife conservationist, and a wildlife biologist about the threats posed to both human and animal health by illegal hunting in Trinidad and Tobago. Everybody, my name is Chris Ora, and I'm a professor of veterinary virology at the Faculty of Medical Sciences at the University of the West Indies in Trinidad and Tobago. So I've been at the University of West Indies now for around 10 years. And one of the things that I've been doing quite a lot, I'm a virologist, but one of the things I've been doing quite a lot is working on this uh, concept of One Health. Professor Aura says the COVID-19 pandemic underscores the close link between human health, animal health, and the environment. And recognizing, understanding and recognizing the connections between the health of humans, animals, and our environment, and the links between them. And so this is this is what we call One Health. And what, with the with this recent COVID-19, it has emphasized the importance of this approach because you know, everybody who knows about the virus COVID-19 realizes that you know, it came through animals into humans. And there are very close links in a lot of cases to animals and humans and our environment. His lab has worked on Trinidad and Tobago's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and he gives the country a passing grade for its handling of the crisis. But mostly, the Caribbean countries are in a, are in a, a very good position. There's some, not, notably there are problems at the moment in the Hispaniola, in, in the DR and, um, and Haiti, where the virus seems to be um, spreading quite quickly. Jamaica seems to be getting the virus control, having had a few spikes. And most other Caribbean countries have really done a very good job at tracking and tracing and testing um, and getting, identifying all the cases that came in, imported cases mostly to start with. And, and, and they've done a very good job at, at, at making sure that the virus hasn't um, gone to the next stage of community spread. I mean, I think Trinidad is doing a, a very good job um, at stopping this virus. But, Professor Aura says, there is a constant threat of other zoonotic diseases because human beings continue to encroach on wildlife habitats. Uh, but there are many, many, many zoonotic pathogens out there that we do need to worry about in the Caribbean. And we live in a world where our, our nature is being, um, is, is being damaged and we're moving into forests and we're moving into environments where wildlife are we're doing a lot of acts that are severely affecting the nature around us so this so it is likely very likely and we've seen it over the past say 20 30 years there's going to be an increase in the amount of potentially zoonotic pathogens coming out of of wildlife into humans and in order to avoid that we need to look at you know where the risks are as regards Trinidad and Tobago. Wildlife biologist and head of the wildlife section of the forestry division, Romano McFarlane, tells us just how much human beings are encroaching on animal habitats in Trinidad. What, what has been the impact of human activities on Trinidad and Tobago's wildlife? Hunting for recreation, the impacts of that over hunting in some areas. For example, even the very hunters may report that 
game animals that were once very common are uh, hardly seen today. Illegal removal of vegetation. You have people illegally going to create agricultural plots. And what they do, they may go on state land and they'll cut the, the vegetation, they will burn it, and they will displace the animals that will live in there. And um, that in itself results in an ecological imbalance. And some of the animals, if they don't find uh, another suitable place, especially based on how fragmented the forest becomes, they will not be able to find another suitable place. In terms of development, for example, when um, the construction of the Sir Solomon Hochoy Highway had taken place, you had um, salt water intrusion inland. And because of that, it would have changed the ecology and where the scarlet ibis would have foraged at certain times of the day, they no longer go there because it's no longer suitable as a habitat for them. The extraction of minerals from the earth, when this happens, the wildlife matters have to take second place, or as they see as the back burner. And two examples is that the, the one existing and thriving Valencia wildlife sanctuary was allowed to be destroyed to get aggregate for construction. And no new sanctuary was created to take its place or to, to make up for what was lost. You also have a in Trinity Hills, where they were prospecting for oil and gas, they had to cut tracks through the pristine wildlife sanctuary of Trinity Hills, and it resulted in forest fragmentation, and it was easier for hunters to get in there and hunt illegally in the sanctuary. Also, songbird keeping, certain species of local, song, local neotropical songbirds no longer exist in the quantum they did, and over-trapping have been blamed for this. And the problem of illegal hunting is an especially grave cause for concern, Ricardo Mead tells us. My name is Ricardo Mead. I am founder, director at the El Socorro Center for Wildlife Conservation. The El Socorro Center for Wildlife Conservation is a registered NGO whose focus is on conserving wildlife through rehabilitation, education, and propagation. How prevalent is the problem of illegal hunting in Trinidad and Tobago? Well, illegal hunting straight up is called poaching, and that is a tremendous problem in Trinidad and Tobago. The season begins, first of all, on the 1st of October each year, and generally ends on the last day of February. Much hunting goes on outside of that allowed period. In many areas where you would go in the country, it goes on year round. There is no stopping. These people never even really would go and get a permit for start of the season because they never even stopped the season. So they hunt at will. Um, this just continues year round. And, you know, it, it's just year round. Trinidad is truly a hunter's paradise with its astounding biodiversity. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago is very unique on this planet. For such a small country, small space, physical land space, 5,500 square kilometers, we have one of the largest array of diversity of wildlife anywhere on Earth. While the Amazon can be described as uh, much more diverse, it is much larger than the area in Trinidad. So for Trinidad to be such a small landmass in, in the Caribbean, though I like to call it South America, the animals that exist here, is, it's just you know, amazing. Uh, close to 500 species of birds, more than 50 species of, of, of snakes. We have amphibians, so much um, wildlife, with the flora and fauna that exists on this tiny space that it has boggled scientists' minds for many years. I see, I see. And I believe that the Northern Range was part of Venezuela at one point, or as yeah. it was, was attached to the South American mainland. Yes, that's why I said, um, although we are considered Caribbean, um, we're really South American. The closest 
if you had to get off this this island, the closest place that you can get off to would be Venezuela, which is only seven kilometers away. And um, and they trace the, the the geology of the landforms and so on. You can see where Trinidad was once joined to South America, and we broke off and shifted away. And Trinidad itself is very unique. What makes it unique? We're even different from Tobago. So it's one country, Trinidad and Tobago. However, there's a, a vast difference. Trinidad being literally broken off from South America, while Tobago is of um, volcanic and coral origin. So they're very different islands, but joined together as one country. And the diversity between the two of them is just mind-boggling. Because what we have, not even South America has it. They have a lot more, but you'll have to spend years and years going all over for what here in Trinidad and Tobago, within hours of moving around the country, you can see so much here in a small, small, diverse country. The endemic species, the birds are the piping guan, or Birla pipil, and the Trinidad motmot, motmotus, motmotus. Those are the two endemic birds that um, we found in Trinidad and Tobago. The piping guan is also listed as a environmentally sensitive species. That means that there's an extra level of protection to that bird, and violating that protection results in the highest fines that is applied to any form of wildlife. Can I ask why you only mentioned two species? Because I know Trinidad has many, many species. Is there a reason why you only mentioned two? Um, yeah, you see what happened? The Act describes wildlife. Right. Animals as only mammals, birds, and reptiles. Uh-huh. And under those, those are the only two endemics. You, oh, have no, you have no endemic mammals, and you have no endemic reptiles, really. So... Oh, you mean that? So how did how did all these species that we have here get here? Most of them are native species. Yes. But um, being native doesn't necessarily mean it's endemic. Okay, could you explain the difference for us, please? Okay, a native species is one that has been here from time immoral. And um, as opposed to an exotic species, one that was brought here for the purpose of, um, let's see, agricultural purposes or pet purposes. And an endemic species is one that you'll only find here and no one else and nowhere else in the world. I see. So you're saying that there are only two species of birds that you'd find only here and nowhere else in the world? Correct. Okay, so could you give, give the game to us again, please? What are they? The piping one which is also known as the Pawi, the scientific name is Obrella pipili. And the Trinidad Motmot is Motmotus Motmotus. Okay, and what about other types of animals? You have many um, native animals. For example, you have um, 100 species of mammals. You have 31 species of frogs. You have... Um, 14 species of testudians, which are turtles, terrapins, and tortoises. You have about 500, 490 species of birds, 630 species of butterflies, and um, there's much more. Hunters on the island exploit this biodiversity indiscriminately. But there are animals that are protected, such as the ant eater. They will kill that and eat that. Um, the ocelots, they will kill that and eat that. And you know, any other animal, the birds, a lot of birds are protected. They will kill them once they come across them, including the pipil pipil, the piping guan, or the pawi, which is endemic to Trinidad. So that's found nowhere else in the world. And colonies of those birds have been wiped out in most areas of the country. They are now found in concentrated areas in the northeast of Trinidad. Uh, because people just literally kill them out where they um, where they were. They call them um, bush turkey. Oh, you mean they eat them? Yes. There's hardly anything that um, they, they they wouldn't eat in Trinidad. They will train their guns in it because somebody will eat it and somebody will pay money for it. 
but the dangers such hunting poses to human and animal welfare are real. I mean, a, a good example of a virus that, and this is, is yellow fever. And we have ha, have outbreaks of yellow fever in Trinidad in the past. Um, and this is a virus that actually uh, tends to stick around in, in some types of monkeys, especially howler monkeys. And we have howler monkeys here. And it's sort of like a reservoir. And it's spread, I guess, from them through, through the, um, the Aedes aegypti mosquito to humans. So in the Southwest Peninsula, there was a time when there were many monkeys found dead in the forest by the forest rangers. And the necropsies of the animals, carcasses reveal that it was indeed yellow fever. So that's a debilitating disease for people. It can also lead to death. Did people used to eat that monkey before in Trinidad? Did and still do. Romana McFarlane says indiscriminate hunting affects wildlife reproduction. We have a long, long hunting season. Five months of active hunting from October the 1st to the end of February. And if guns are used right through, it could never be sustainable. And in that long season, covers a lot of breeding periods for a lot of the animals. And all mammals, many times, are after being shot and slaughtered, then they discover that the females are pregnant. There is no specific time to hunt any specific animals. All animals are hunted within that period, and it matters not if some are pregnant, if, some are, if it's in mating season, it matters not. And this should not continue. The rest that are mating and breeding should be left alone to mate and breed and keep sustainable levels. The, the volume of reports, and they are all consistent, it's a kind of warning bells that are um, in some areas over hunting may be taking place. Both McFarlane and Ricardo Mead say the problem also affects the viability of wildlife habitats. Let me just give you a little background about the habitat. Now, in natural forest formations, you have at least three, um, three seasonal forest formations, three mountain formations, five edaphic formations, right? And totaling to 11 or 12 specific habitats. Now, each one of these habitats will support a particular type of organism or an animal. For example, uh, like a Moorish um, oriole, which is a bird, will only live in areas palm swamps where the Moorish palm is dominant. So if that habitat was to be destroyed, that could spell the end of the bird. Now, together with 100 species of mammals, including 68 species of bats, so some of these bats roost in caves, some in tree cavities, some in foliage, some have a mixed diet, some are strictly um, insectivorous bats, some are strictly fruit bats. You have 12 species of rodents. And you have, um, and I mentioned to you about the amount of butterflies, etc. Now, when you look at all of this, you have a whole series of ecological activity taking place. And the loss of any one of these animals could alter a habitat because it will alter the ecological activity. And because of that, what could result? You, we could lose seed dispensers. Seed dispensers are bats, birds, insects, butterflies. And when you lose seed dispensers, you lose natural vegetation because there's nothing to dispense the seed to continue the growth of new trees. You will lose pollinators. So even though you have trees, the trees would not be pollinated, so they would not bear and there's less food. We could lose detritivores organisms. 
animals that help to break down organic material. We will lose some vermin. We will lose some carrion eaters. And when we lose carrion eaters and carrion remain in the environment, this could lead to a lot of disease. When you, when, when you lose a species, it's not just simply a species you're losing, but it triggers a whole series of um, activities that manifest themselves in a lot of negative ways. So that's how serious it is. So have, have you seen any impacts as yet, any results, any fallout as yet from the pressure that the animals are being put under because of, of declining numbers of some species? Not, not in recent times, but over the years, when you have the, let's say, a resurgence of malaria or a resurgence of dengue, it's not only because the population of mosquitoes would have increased. Sometimes it's a lack of, for example, some of the insect-eating bats that would have devoured these mosquitoes, which have been no longer wrong because probably their habitat would have been destroyed. So when they are not around to take care of the mosquitoes, mosquitoes increase and they vector these, um, these pathogens that affect us. That's just an example. However, sometimes in making some, sometimes it's difficult to make the exact link. But these are the things that, that usually happens when you remove the species. However, no one has as yet bothered to do the math to know the real impact of hunting on wildlife. So do you have any hard numbers in relation to biodiversity impacts on species numbers? Have have there been any, do you have any data on that to share? Well, that is part of the problem that we face going forward. There has been no real baseline studies to acquire data to show, hey, 10 years ago we had X amount, now we have Y amount. That's a downward trend of 10, 20, 30%. So it's, it's all anecdotal. It's all like we used to see plenty, now we don't see it anymore. Um, some of it is very obvious before eyes, but again, someone can challenge it. Okay, so where are your numbers? Where are your numbers? Plenty doesn't mean anything. Little bit doesn't mean anything. What are the numbers that show that there is a trend downwards, upwards, show us the data? And you cannot come about that data unless someone would have over the years literally done the studies, done the wildlife surveys, the wildlife counts. The declining is observation and it's not scientifically supported, right? It is reported, but not scientifically supported. And what would you need to be able to have the hard scientific data? I mean, is it that the the funding isn't there for the research or what exactly is is, is the problem? You need to have continued research in, in that area. So you'll be able to see a trend in um, if populations are dying, if populations are declining, increasing, or remaining stable. Some years ago, around 2013 to 2015, a national wildlife survey was done, but the manner in which it was planned and executed raise more questions than answers. So at this time, I, I could only say for sure that there have been no consistent, proper surveying wildlife census done on the game animals. So it comes all the way back down to a simple word, management. There has been absolutely no management. So now you cannot really account for anything. Wildlife biologist Romana McFarlane says data would help with better management. No management of hunting is, is, is like you have to know what is what you have to know what is, what exists. You have to know how many animals are hunted, you have to know what remains, you have to know the condition of the animals, and that assessment is aided by what is returned from the hunters. And if it's not returned in time, you may not have enough time to to assess what is out there. And when you assess what is out there, you may have to recommend some legislation to correct it. Now, when someone hunts, they purchase a hunting permit. And active hunting stops in February. 
but they are given until May to return that. When the deadline is so long, it's more time for a margin of error. As hunters only on the deadline, they will fill it up. By that time, they would have forgot a lot of what had taken place months, months before. So that should be returned right after the hunting season, active hunting was closed. Another thing with hunting is that hunting needs to be more specifically regulated as with tags. When you buy one hunting permit, for example, if you buy a, a permit for a deer, it does not matter if you shoot one deer, 100 or 1 million. One permit is sufficient. And that could never be a sustainable method. The only bag limits we have are for waterfowl. And we need to have a tag system. The tag system will be one tag per animal. And if we use the tags and the amount of animals that are hunted remains the same and a tag remains and a, the, the cost of a tag would be the cost of a permit it would generate at least four million dollars more annually to the national treasury and that money now can be used to pay at least 30 game wardens for the whole year right now the establishment is short of 26. the tagging system too will also be self-managed because you can assess what, what was hunted by based on the amount of tags sold and returned. What's not sold would be returned. And the beauty of the tagging system too is as an animal is shot, it has to be tagged before it is moved. And the tag could only be used once. He says he would like to see the legislation updated to more efficiently manage wildlife. I want to go back to the, the Conservation of Wildlife Act. And um, I just would like to emphasize that that act should be revamped and um, updated for, for the benefit of present and, and, and future needs, as it's about 70 years now since it has been established with only about 10 amendments. So it's important. It's what governs wildlife. It needs to, to fix how we are allowed to currently hunt. Better wildlife management would certainly reduce the threat from zoonotic diseases. Professor Ora tells us what else is needed to reduce this threat. He also explains what Trinidad and Tobago must do to protect itself from a second wave of COVID-19, even as reports appear in the local press of persons entering the country illegally by boat and then disappearing into the countryside. How, what do we need to do to try to avoid a second peak of COVID-19? Well, that's the the six million dollar question um, that all countries now are grappling with is, uh, you know, how how are they going? To, how are we going to stop a second peak? And it's a real challenge in temperate countries like the UK, uh, going to because we know from the history of influenza viruses that in the winter, when people go inside, that's when you get usually get the biggest peak. In Trinidad, what we have to do is try, on it and the Caribbean, is we have to try to avoid any introduction into the country. So, I mean, you've got to be very careful because there's a lot of potential open doors for people to come in, such as in this, in, you know, from Venezuela and things like that, which where there will be, a, 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 an undoubtedly, the virus will be spreading out of control, probably. But but if we can try to keep that window, that door closed and keep a close eye on the people coming in. There's no reason why uh, we can't keep the situation as it is, which is no, 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 no spread in the country. But if it is introduced into the country, we then need to stamp on it very quickly. And we know what we're doing. We know how to do that. We know how to do that. We've done it effectively, but basically being incredibly efficient at stopping the virus uh, are trying to stop the virus coming into our countries, but if it does come in, then snuffing it out as soon as possible. And that's what will avoid any second or third waves. And it, it, it can be done. 
uh, we can do it. Uh, it's just a matter of being very organized and efficient. Uh, Caribbean countries have proved that they can do it because many, uh, many people with the virus came in and the virus started spreading in many countries in a limited way. And, uh, and, and the majority of countries in the Caribbean have uh, have, have tested and tracked and traced and got rid of it. And that was in an early stage as well, when, you know, it takes a little bit of time and we were learning about the virus. Certainly in Trinidad, what we need is in place. Uh, so it's there and waiting so it can be used um, straight away. So I think many Carib Caribbean countries, including Trinidad, are in a good place at the moment compared to many other countries around the world that are in a very, very bad place at the moment. The whole idea of uh, and the fact that I said earlier that so many, how such a high percentage of these viruses um, that affect animals can get, can get into humans. We always have to be very wary about this barrier, this inter interconnection between and wildlife, especially, and humans, because of this risk that the viruses can jump from wildlife to, to humans. And wherever you have hunting, in order for this to happen, you know, you have to have... Um, obviously direct contact um, in, a, in a dirty way um, often from or between wildlife and humans because the virus needs an opportunity to jump across. Um, and any way or practice that, that, that enables this, you know, can, can, can increase the risk of the virus coming across. So, so hunting, which is what, what, what the question you were after, obviously, you know, hunting, um, when people are hunting um, wildlife, indiscriminately for for food then there is a danger that the viruses from that are present in the wildlife like it's happened in china for example if you have those viruses in the wildlife in the first place if you don't take appropriate precautions such as in the wet markets in china from the hunted killed animals from the from from the blood or the uh, uh, organs of that. Uh, if the blood, it, it, if humans have close contact with that, then it gives the, the virus a chance to get across. So you know, the hunt from a hunting point of view, I'm not somebody that that says we should ban hunting. You know, and because hunting is a very important cultural thing in many countries, and in many countries, hunting is a very important source of food, and people have been doing it for hundreds and thousands of years, and it's not up to likes of people like me to say that we should we should stop it but certainly it's up to people like me to say that you know we have to try to mitigate or, or reduce the risk that viruses from wildlife will jump into humans and there are ways of doing that because you you know you, you just basically clean up that link um so it's a matter of regulating hunting and making sure education and making sure that hunters understand that there is a risk there, not and, and not necessarily saying we should we should ban hunting completely, and making sure that the food is is, is processed from wild meat is processed in a in a hygienic way. Uh, and of course, once we um, uh, once people I don't eat wildlife myself, but. But, but, but once people actually cook the meat, then the vast majority, if not all the pathogens, will be killed by the cooking process. So the danger is that process before the cooking process, when you've got, you know, the, the blood, when you're butchering the animals. And that's when it needs to be, you need to have the regulations and the, the hygienic conditions in place, which, and, uh, and for that people, hunters need to understand the risks. So it's education to a certain extent. This is Jewel Fraser looking at zoonotic diseases and the threats posed by illegal hunting in Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you for listening to this Voices from the Global South podcast.